Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 in your touchstone telephone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn over the meeting to Beth Matfield. You may begin. Thank you, Angela. Welcome to the second webinar uh, in a series of five. This is entitled in the, I'm sorry, Methamphetamine, a webinar series dedicated to promote public health partnerships and safety for critically affected populations. Today's topic, Women and Methamphetamine, Challenges in Treatment and Meeting Family Needs, will focus on issues women who use methamphetamine encounter related to treatment services, related to the root causes, impacted by trauma and shame, and the added stress of pregnancy, children, and families. As the operator said, time permitting, we will allow for questions after each of the presentations today. And so you will, on your phone, press star one, and then you will be in a queue and the operator will allow, you know, will ask for your name and then introduce you for your question. Also note, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, you should see an icon that looks like three pieces of paper overlapping each other. There are support documents available for this um, webinar. Those documents are not necessary to be opened during the webinar, so please do not log out of the webinar in order to see those documents, but they will be available for you to view following the webinar as well as to download. Um, what you would do is download those presentations. Each of the PowerPoint presentations will be on, that, uh, on the list of documents as well. If you need technical assistance at any time during the call, please dial, press zero to speak to the operator. Uh, opening today's webinar is Dr. Ed Kraft. I will now turn it over to him for a few opening <coughs> remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, my name is Ed Kraft. As the methamphetamine lead for SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and the government project officer for SAMHSA's Methamphetamine, the National Summit to Promote Public Health, Partnerships, and Safety for Critically Affected Populations, it is also my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, the second in the series. Women are undoubtedly one of the most critically affected populations by methamphetamine. Access to treatment, issues of violence, trauma, and shame, and concerns with successful parenting and maintaining parental rights are just a few of the challenges, issues that impact women. We are most fortunate to have two outstanding speakers to help us explore and address these issues today. These accomplished experts will be introduced momentarily by my colleague, Beth Massell. But first, I would like to remind you that this webinar series is part of SAMHSA's commitment to provide follow-up technical assistance to methamphetamine the National Summit to Promote Public Health, Partnerships, and Safety for Critically Affected Populations. This summit was held in November 2008 and brought together 20 state and territory action teams whose leaders were appointed by the governor to develop plans to address their challenges related to methamphetamine that they could implement when they returned home. As a matter of fact, more than 400 individuals participated in this summit, including representatives of national organizations, academic institutions, and representatives of underserved communities. Since the summit, states and territories have been working feverishly to implement their action plans. FEMSA has maintained monthly contact with each action team and responded to various requests for technical assistance. This webinar series arose from those requests. SAMHSA is delighted to respond and to welcome all of today's participants, whether or not you participated in the original summit. SAMHSA hopes you find today's program informative and helpful, and we look forward to your participation in the remaining webinars, which include LGBT populations have met, updates for addressing challenges and maximizing opportunities on March 2nd. Uh, on March 16th, data and mess. What do we know about methamphetamine? What are the policy implications? And how can we learn more about the critical populations? And finally, on March 29th, does this involve persons and mess addressing a full continuum of services? And now, back to you, Beth. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. 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 Thank you, Dr
Thank you, Dr. Kraft. It, this, this whole series would really not be um, possible without your support and your efforts with the initiative, and we truly appreciate that. Thank you. Our, uh, starting us off today is our first speaker, Dr. Virginia Rondero Hernandez. Dr. Rondero Hernandez is an associate professor in the Department of Social Work Education at California State University at Fresno and a faculty researcher evaluator for the Central California Social Welfare in Social Welfare Evaluation Research and Training Center at Fresno State. She has also held teaching posts at Texas State University, San Marcos, and the Warden School of Social Service at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Hernandez has taught at the university level at the university level for 18 years and specializes in teaching research, policy, and human behavior. Her social work career includes service in clinics, hospitals, hospice, schools, and community-based agencies. She has conducted research related to fetal alcohol syndrome, maternal child health services, child health disparities, Latino mental health, and substance abuse services. She is the principal investigator for the Methamphetamine Recovery Project, a regional needs assessment of substance abuse services in Central California, and recently completed a sabbatical research project fielding connections and evidence-based shame resilience curriculum to women in residential treatment for substance abuse. She currently serves as a member of the 2009 Steering Committee for the Methamphetamine National Summit to promote public health partnerships and safety for critically affected populations. Welcome, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you, Beth. And good morning, well, good afternoon to folks on the eastern side of the country. Um, this is a real privilege uh, to be able to present to you today. Um, but as I've mentioned before when I present on this topic, that I really do it in the name of the women that I met um, along the way in my career, but more specifically during my sabbatical research. Uh, it's their stories that actually bring meaning uh, to the research that I do and certainly bring meaning to the work that we do in the field with them. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed. <clears throat> this is my first webinar, so um, I, it's, uh, everything should go smoothly, um, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, first slide, and I want to uh, note right away that every slide has annotations, numerical annotations, and at the very end, um, those numbers will correspond to references on the reference list. So at any point in time, if you would like to uh, look at those references, I encourage you to do so. I mean, we're here today because we know that women, excuse me, <clears throat> are critically affected by methamphetamine in ways different than men. Just some background information. In 2008, the rate of females reporting past month use of illicit drugs was comparable to uh, that of men. And that is a statistic that comes out of the National Survey for Drug Use and Health, uh, 2008. Also, another point, there's evidence to support uh, that women use meth at rates similar to men, and this is the result of research that has been done in the field by some leading researchers, some of whom are listening today. Um, meth use, we know, is especially prominent among mothers involved in child welfare systems, and uh, Nancy Young will be talking to, about, talking to us about that in higher detail later. Um, for those of you who are calling, you probably know the reasons that uh, women use meth. Uh, they're different, uh, sometimes self-medicating in terms of re working with issues related to trauma, um, sometimes body image related in terms of wanting to lose weight, uh, again, self-medicating for controlling symptoms of depression or other psychiatric conditions. It's an easy way to boost one's self-confidence. Uh, and to feel good about oneself, uh, and also to enhance sexual experiences. We do know that uh, it also is associated with domestic violence, as other substances are. History of physical and sexual abuse uh, is not unusual uh, among women who use meth, and certainly um, using any substance, including methamphetamine, to escape um, is another reason, as well as addressing one's uh, low self-esteem and very definitely increasing energy level. Um, there is a practitioner's uh, reference book that is listed uh, that was created by the um, uh, 
um, Institute of Substance Abuse Programs uh, out of UCLA. It's a fabulous document. Uh, if you have a chance to look at it, um, that is where some of this information came from. Okay, moving forward. Some clinical issues for women who misuse methamphetamine. Um, some we've seen in the previous slide, but to be more specific, history of sexual abuse, physical abuse and trauma. Uh, we also know that women don't necessarily use methamphetamine by itself and that it's often used with other forms of substance. Uh, the types of mental health issues that are reported in the literature as, and co-occurring disorders include depression, anxiety, paranoia, um, emotional disassociation, um, difficulties with verbal communication, hypersexuality, um, antisocial behaviors, and violent behaviors. We also know that some of the clinical issues are related to, their rela to women's relationships, uh, specifically engaging in sexual, risky sexual behaviors, unprotected sex, um, as well as domestic violence. And those relationships extend to uh, family members and children also. We know that pregnancy and uh, parenting problems um, will be associated with this population, and very often uh, these women who are pregnant and or parenting are involved in child welfare system. And then, of course, the other clinical issue includes medical issues. And if you've worked with women who have used, misused methamphetamine, we know those medical issues to be dental problems, um, weight loss, skin problems, and very definitely increased risk of HIV infection. Here are some other issues that women face, though, and uh, this is the literature of Stephanie Covington. In fact, we're going to be looking at several slides that are attributed to Dr. Covington's work. Treatment issues. Uh, we know that for women, sometimes the services are limited, are very limited and not available to them. Waiting lists um, are another. Lack of child care, especially for our patients. Uh, and too few facilities that house children. Uh, a federal report uh, noted that uh, currently in treatment facilities, only 14% of them accommodate women with children. Even though we know that uh, living in therapeutic community is is a form of best practice for women in substance abuse uh, treatment and recovery. Systemic issues are is another area. When women lack financial resources um, or communities lack those financial resources uh, to provide services for them, clean, sober um, housing situations are often few. And coordination of services um, can be an issue too, especially if you are involved with multiple systems at the same time. Uh, the classical uh, example being being involved with child welfare system and uh, county uh, alcohol and drug programs. And employment opportunities, that's definitely a systemic opportunity or issue for women also. There also are psycho social issues, social and psychological isolation. Uh, disconnection, fear, self-blame, struggles in coping with demands of treatment and recovery. And as practitioners in the field, we see this, um, working with women in treatment and recovery, and we see those in different ways with women who have a history of, using, of misusing methamphetamine. One of the um, major inroads in treatment has been completed by Stephanie Covington in her work. Uh, she has brought to our attention that we need to be, be very aware uh, from a gender perspective when it comes to treatment for women, that gender awareness is the key to effective treatment for women. So what does that mean? Um, basically, uh, when we're talking about gender awareness, we're talking about realizing that gender shapes the context in which women grow. Uh, this is expressed through the roles that are assigned to them and the status that they have in our society. Their lives are composed of life experiences as female living in a male-based society, um, often also being held up to male-based um, expectations and treatment. Gender awareness also acknowledges that the dominant culture, uh, which is male-based, often promotes gender-based norms, values, and behaviors. 
uh, and some of those uh, fit for women, sometimes they do not. Women's lives are also impacted by living as a female in a male-based society. Uh, again, uh, being constrained and con uh, to certain roles uh, as women doesn't allow for certain types of opportunities or even the abilities to protect oneself. Women's needs do differ. Uh, they differ based on population characteristics. Um, if folks are uh, familiar with the concept of intersectionality, we know that women is a, are a population, but there are different types of women within that particular population uh, where they may have ethnic differences, um, gender differences, class differences, educational differences, et cetera. Women's needs, women's needs also differ based on roles that they've been ascribed uh, in their lifetime. Uh, and one of the struggles that I've seen in my sabbatical research is the questioning around role that has been ascribed by one's culture. Personal and social expectations are placed upon them, um, and in that sense, their needs differ. And exposure to traumatic events um, are not uncommon among women, especially women who need to use methamphetamine. Gender-related experiences and differences are intertwined, in other words in women's substance abuse issues. Um, this is Covington's argument. Therefore, gender-specific treatment responses are needed. So what is a gender-specific model? What, what is a model that, that is in, embeds this gender orientation? Uh, one of them that we're mostly familiar with is that of trauma-informed treatment. Uh, we know that studies exist that tell us that problematic disorders and conditions among women diagnosed with both post-traumatic stress disorder and substance abuse um, is, is common. Um, and it appears more often with women with this co-occurrence than women that are diagnosed with either one of these conditions alone. Uh, Covington recommends that trauma-informed treatment include several aspects. Uh, the first one is very definitely taking the trauma into account in treatment planning. It is a life event issue for women some, and functions as a barrier for some. So knowing what kind of traumatic events uh, a woman may have been exposed to and survived uh, needs to be taken into account when we're devising treatment. Avoiding trauma triggers um, that could lead to traumatic reaction or re-traumatizing the woman. And these, this is very definitely a practice issue uh, in terms of the types of ways we establish relationship with women and nurture those relationships. Um, and to really call into question the types of practice, uh, practice behaviors we may be using that actually trigger trauma. And we'll talk about how we sometimes trigger shame later on. Adjusting the behavior of treatment personnel so as to support a woman's coping capacity. We know that the um, equation is that in order to reduce stress, we need to inco increase coping. And so certainly uh, focusing on what we can do to increase women's coping capacity is, is primary in a trauma-informed treatment model. Also allowing women to successfully manage their trauma symptoms. Uh, so that they are better able to accept services and treatment. And moving to, to success uh, sometimes represents um, what Covington uh, represents as a spiral of addiction and healing. And uh, you can find that in her, um, her workbook on trauma. It's not always uh, one straight line. Uh, it has its passes up and down. Trauma-informed principles are reflected in Covington's files, as I said, of addiction, recovery, and trauma healing. And trauma-informed treatment requires a deep sensitivity uh, to trauma-related issues, with an emphasis on helping the woman to heal uh, as best as she's able. Covington cites the work of Herman, uh, a three-stage model for trauma recovery, which has the characteristics of creating safety, uh, for women, um, um, providing venues in which they can recall and remember uh, those traumatic events and to mourn them, 
and then to move past that uh, towards reconnection. And often that reconnection happens in the form of supportive social networks that begin in treatment and hopefully extend out to community. I have a listing of what I would consider to be best practices for women in treatment. Uh, one of the assignments that I was given a couple of years ago by a consortium of child welfare workers that we work with here in San Joaquin Valley was to look at the intersection of methamphetamine abuse and child welfare. And in that process, uh, we were able to identify a list of best practices for women in treatment. And so I, I've had them enumerated here. The first one is that treatment um, that's individualized least restrictive and provides a continuum of care with regular performance evaluations or benchmarks conducted to assess the need for increased or decreased levels of care. By the way, I do want to mention that these uh, best practices are characteristics that we identified in models um, used across the country with women. So I have a separate report not available here, but I'd be more than happy to email to you if you'd like to see that. Uh, second best practice, comprehensive and multidimensional treatment that addresses the physical, emotional, and mental health needs of individuals and their families and other support systems. Woman does not stand alone. She's surrounded by a number of systems, and we need to address those systems also. Family-centered treatment, uh, which addresses the needs of all family members uh, while promoting the family's participation and support in the recovery process, engaging family as partners in treatment and recovery. Supports that maximize the success of treatment outcomes in outpatient settings as well as residential settings. And also treatment that's cognitively, behaviorally based, uh, gender specific, trauma informed, and long term and duration with intensity of treatment decreasing over time as a way of helping a woman to build her capacity um, to. Um, self-soothe, to um, manage her life challenges, to achieve successes, sometimes even failures, but moving forward all the way. Additional best practices for women in treatment, <laughs> treatment on demand, uh, so that women can take advantage of windows of opportunity when um, they're ready out there looking for treatment. Um, this is an interesting concept. Um, Basically, it's an open door policy, willing to take people in if possible, uh, and if not, finding ways to get them to go to treatment. Multidisciplinary team, uh, including therapists, referring agencies, uh, mental health service providers, and providers of other services, uh, such as medical services, family related services, legal services, financial counseling, housing, transportation education and vocational training. Comprehensive services, almost a wraparound concept. Uh, case management, preventive services, counseling, crisis intervention, and safety planning. Also including substance abuse testing and linkages and referrals to resources in the community, including housing and other ancillary services. And finally, outcome and quality assurance measures to evaluate program effectiveness. Uh, we like to think that our interventions work, um, but what's important is that we be collecting data and we work with a competent evaluator uh, and preferably somebody who has that information in-house also and is knowledgeable about that, about that to make sure that uh, the outcomes that we set out to achieve are actually being achieved. I want to introduce one other element, too, um, that wasn't in those best, practice, uh, best practices slides. And this also represents a couple of domains of research that I have been involved in also. And that's the management of stigma and shame. You know, utilizing and adhering to treatment is a challenge for anybody uh, who needs those services because of the shame and stigma associated with substance abuse uh, problems. And that shame and stigma we'll learn um, is not just something that's internal, it's also externally reinforced by our society. 
I found an interesting piece of information in, in the 2007 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, it was about resistance to treatment. And the statistics are presented in the survey. It's a household survey. 15% of the respondents reported they did not seek treatment in spite of feeling that they needed it. Um, they feared that their neighbors or the community might think ill of them. And they worried about the potential negative effects going to treatment might have on their job. On the other side, shame. Shame um, has a real influential role in a wide range of mental health and public health issues. Um, it affects self-esteem, concept issues. It contributes to depression, addiction, eating disorders, bullying, suicide, family violence, um, sexual assault. Uh, there are a number of studies that will demonstrate these associations and relationships. There's also mounting empirical evidence that points to the fact that shame is important. Shame is, has importance in treatment and recovery. It's considered the master emotion of everyday life and preeminent because of emotional distress in our time. A dominant emotion um, experience, uh, shame is, um, it, it's felt and, and, and it actually exceeds anger, fear, grief, and anxiety based on the science that we have. As a notation, these findings imply that researchers and practitioners need to be more invested in understanding and confronting stigma and shame at individual and community levels. So we're going to look at it a little more closely. Stigma, what is stigma? Stigma has been categorized into several broad areas, and you see them there. Public attitudes, discriminatory practices, experience discrimination, perceived stigma, self or internalized stigma. And I have references that can instruct you more specifically on those. We know that stigma, though, is dynamic and interactive. And it's a process that occurs when several what we call interrelated components converge. And those interrelated components include distinguishing and labeling of human differences, um, the linking of dominant cultural beliefs with undesirable characteristics, i.e., or for example, negative stereotypes. A, a sense of separation of, of us versus them. That person has a drug addiction problem. We don't. The experience of status loss and discrimination felt by those labeled. And contingencies that support stigmatization. Uh, contingencies meaning that there are um, features in our environment that um, lead us to prefer to stigmatize people about what occurs to them um, as opposed to not. All you have to do is look at the news sometimes and, uh, you know, the, the way that the information is conveyed is stigma first, uh, understanding why it's second. These processes are primarily driven by, you know, two major forms of stigma, perceived stigma and public stigma. Perceived meaning how people with substance abuse uh, issues uh, perceive stigma to be, what do other people think about me, as well as public stigma, which I think most of us are more aware of. Shame defined. Um, shame, uh, is, this is the definition of Brene Brown, um, who is the author of Connections. Um, of, it's a 12-session psychoeducational shame resilience curriculum. I'll be, it's the one that I fielded from sabbatical leave. Her definition is that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we're flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Um, I heard much, I heard those kinds of definitions when I was in the field in the fall. Shame is a distinct construct uh, that differs from embarrassment, guilt, and humiliation. And very quickly, embarrassment is more social embarrassment. embarrassment. We, get, we all get embarrassed. But one of the things about embarrassment is that it's generally fleeting. Um, we all have felt guilt, uh, and guilt is aligned with a sense of responsibility, the thought that I could have done it differently, and things may have turned out differently. And then humiliation, which I think that when you're looking at people who are victimized by forms of abuse, be they children or women, uh, humiliation is a component. Uh, it is the constant message over and over again that you are no good, you're not worthy, et cetera. Um, if that humiliation is done enough, um, it, it feels shame. And shame, the difference between shame and, say, guilt, for example, guilt has 
is what I get, whereas shame is what I am. So shame and guilt, you know, they need to be considered uh, separately. They come up very much uh, in the world of substance abuse treatment. And they need to be uh, considered separately, both in the prevention and treatment of substance misuse. Um, I'm going to begin to talk about my sabbatical experience. And before I do that, I want to introduce you to shame resilience theory. Shame resilience theory is the outcome of the original work of Brene Brown. Brene Brown is actually a faculty member at the University of Houston. Uh, the aim of her study, and this is her doctoral research, was to generate a theory grounded in data that explains why and how women experience shame, how shame impacts women, the various processes and strategies women employ to resolve their main concerns regarding the impact and consequences of shame. So what she learned is that shame resilience theory proposes that the main concerns that are related to shame are the feelings of being trapped, powerless, and isolated. Not uncommon experiences in um, treatment and that these concerns intersect with each other. The majority of emotions, thoughts, behaviors demonstrated by women experiencing shame are efforts to develop shame resilience through connection, power, and freedom. Women don't like people in general, and women definitely don't like being ashamed. They're going to move forward, but sometimes to, to protect themselves, sometimes the way they move forward is not necessarily um, pro-social. So this is Connections. Connections is the psychoeducational shame resilience curriculum uh, that Brene Brown developed. It focuses on helping women move from a state of shame to a state of empathy and building shame resilience competencies. Now, I do want to say that the curriculum uh, was, the research was originally done with women, uh, it expanded out to men, so that now it is being utilized with men. But originally it was developed for women in treatment. And it's available on the Hazelton website. Shame resilience competencies include four major elements, recognizing shame and shame triggers, practicing critical awareness of shame and critical awareness of those triggers, building and reaching out to healthy social networks, and learning to speak shame. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what I did was I fielded connections to women in treatment beginning in the summer of 2009 into the fall, all the way up to December. Um, I was interested in testing the effects of the curriculum um, as it functions as a barrier to treatment and recovery. And I also wanted to extend knowledge about substance abuse treatment interventions in a region noted for high levels of methamphetamine use. Uh, California is no longer the cooking capital of the nation, however, um, the legacy of meth is still very broad in our area. It's the number one drug for which uh, people go into county-funded uh, services, at least in our area. Uh, so I fielded uh, connections at three residential treatment facilities in San Joaquin Valley, uh, which stretches from um, San Joaquin County, um, that the valley does, uh, right below Sacramento, and it ends at Kern County, uh, which is near the um, pass over to LA. Um, but the sites that I uh, went to were located, two of them were located in Fresno. One was a county funded site, the second was a state corrections funded site, and the third site was in Merced County um, in Atwater, California. And so I got these three locales uh, where I fielded the research. And the research uh, was approved by our Human Subjects Committee here at CSU Fresno. Here's the demographics. Now, I need to say this is an exploratory study. Um, I was just interested to see how it worked. And so what I'm going to present to you are um, the demographics of this sample only, and the statistics that will follow are for descriptive purposes. Um, the sample size is not large enough um, to, to support it beyond descriptive purposes. So the demographics for that, even though we started out with, I started out with about 25 women, uh, it shrunk to 23, and eventually the final uh, number uh, was 19. Uh, and I was able to collect pre and post enough data on this. Participation in connections was voluntary. Um, the age range of the participants was from 25 to 55 years old. Average age was 36. 
10 of the 19 identified as Latino Hispanic. And that is reflective of um, population here. Um, here in the uh, valley, we have uh, four of our eight counties are now minority um, majority counties, Latino, Latino counties. 84% of the women in the sample were mothers of children with uh, ages 17 or less. 11 of them reported methamphetamine as the primary drug use, and three of them as the secondary drug use. By the way, second to meth um, was alcohol. Um, the average number of times these women had been in treatment was about at least twice, a little more than that. The average length of stay when they were exposed to the curriculum was 64 days. The mental health diagnoses reported were bipolar 1 and 2, depression, and PTSD, not uncommon for most populations uh, in substance abuse treatment. And, and for the women that were from, that came out of the correction setting, we have a regional women's prison out here. Um, the average number of times they'd been incarcerated, and of course there were some women that had been jailed too, was 3.7, and 12 of the 19 had transitioned out of the regional women's prison. Prison. These were the pre and post test measures that I used on the left. Some of you may be in, um, interested to know that the first two, the General Health Questionnaire and the Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale, are publicly available scales. You can use them yourself, find them on the internet, learn how to score them. It's relatively easy. The third one was the Perceived Substance Abuse Scale. It's been, it's, uh, been developed by Jason Lawama, who's in Portland, Oregon, and some of his colleagues out of the University of Nevada Arena. Um, the internalized change scale, which I think many of us are um, familiar with, it measures for both internalized shame as well as self-concept. The test of self-conscious affect version 3, uh, which measures for shame, blame, and guilt self-talk that women use. And then a shame is a self-evaluation that comes with the curriculum. You can see on the right-hand side that when I did pre-post-test comparisons that um, the differences were statistically significant at 0.05 or less on nine of the 12 scales and subscales. Um, what that means is that there were reduced levels of distress, internalized shame, less uh, shame self-talk used by the women, and less blame self-talk used um, at the end of the curriculum. Um, there were uh, differences and statistically significant differences in self-esteem levels as well as shame resilience levels. The women, women basically felt they had built those skills up. Um, I want to switch gears for just a little bit because I would like to um, when I help us all remember that what we are being asked to do in the field is to find and define uh, evidence-based practices uh, for women in treatment, uh, and including women uh, in the, uh, using methamphetamine. Now, if you haven't seen SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, there's the website. That's a live link. You can click on it. Um, and so what I did, just as in, to demonstrate how it works, is I did a sample search using the following words or phrases in the search. You know, they're listed there, female substance treatment, co-occurring. Um, I wanted to know where, what those residential and patient type settings were. I used the word correctional different types of uh, living settings, mix of public and proprietary um, interventions. I looked at interventions, a lot of ones that had been replicated or partially funded by National Institute of Health um, because these are advanced models. And I wanted to evaluate them and see if there had been any comparative um, research done. These are the results of that one Search. Now, I'm not saying that what you see right here, uh, that there aren't other programs that are evidence-based. These are the programs that popped up um, based on the keywords that I put in the search. So that what the National Registry of Evidence-Based uh, Practice and Practices and Programs is saying is that for all the keywords that I put in, the Boston Consortium model, which is out of Boston, it's a trauma-informed substance abuse treatment program for women. Live link right there. Uh, for, forever free. Uh, it's a drug treatment program that's used for women who abuse drugs and are incarcerated. 
and the trauma recovery and empowerment model as group-based intervention to facilitate trauma recovery among women with histories of exposure to sexual and physical abuse. Again, these are only a few of the programs that appear on the registry, and I would heartily encourage you to search out that registry uh, as a way of, in, of comparing um, how closely your interventions with women match those with uh, what are considered to be best practices and evidence-based. So here are the conclusions. Uh, the best practices for women addicted to methamphetamine include approaches that address, address clinical issues, help them strengthen coping skills, promote building of healthy social networks, and principles of recovery and wellness. Also, trauma-informed, gender-specific treatment is currently the most appropriate for, approach for women with addiction issues, including methamphetamine. Management of stigma and shame needs to be addressed in best practice approaches, and it, their needs, organizations and agencies need to evaluate themselves to see if they may unknowingly uh, be, uh, be promoting stigma and shame in their processes. Being informed about nationally recognized evidence-based practices promotes best practices, approaches with us all, but as a, as a um, qualifier, knowledge about practices that produce evidence that many of us know about, they need to be studied and disseminated. Uh, we need to be able to share that information and to be able to um, figure out what works best for women. Just a little um, cartoon, and it's not coming up. The message is basically lifting the voices of recovery has to do with making sure that we are giving people chances. Uh, and that we expect the very best for them. That should come out in your PowerPoint if you download it. Hey, there's one, having rights the same, the same as others. And list of references, and I'm done. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Andero Hernandez. We appreciate you taking the time and sharing your expertise. Uh, at this time, I know we had talked about possibly having time for questions in between the presentations, but I would like to actually hold the questions until the end of the um, webinars so that we give fair time for our second presenter. Um, joining us now will be our next speaker, Dr. Nancy Young. Dr. Young is the Director of Children and Family Futures, a California-based research and policy institute that works to improve outcomes for children and families, particularly those affected by alcohol and other drugs, and involved in the welfare and child welfare system. She currently serves as the director of the federally funded National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, and also serves as the director of the federally funded Regional Partnership Grantee Support Contract, which provides guidance and technical assistance to grantees striving to improve safety and permanency outcomes for children affected by methamphetamine or other substance abuse. She has been involved in numerous projects related to alcohol and other drug issues in the welfare and child welfare in the welfare and child welfare system, including many projects with the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. Over the past seven years, Dr. Young has worked as a consultant to over 30 states and regional offices on prevention and treatment issues affecting families involved with welfare and child welfare. We are certainly uh, happy to have her with us today and appreciate taking her time out of her schedule. Dr. Young, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you to Dr. Kraft and to our Federal Project Officer, Sharon Amatetti, for uh, inviting us to share information with you today. We're uh, excited to be able to put a focus on women and their children and some of the work that has gone on with the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare and ways in which we are uh, addressing this issue. I want to start with just a real brief history. How did, how did we get to here with what the state of knowledge is about substance abuse, child welfare, and, court, and families who are involved in the family court, uh, often referred to as the dependency court or juvenile court in some of your states, uh, and how we at the National Center are approaching this issue with developing technical assistance resources and the way in which we're looking at collaborative practice. Uh, so in that brief history, it, we found in the early 90s, in the mid-90s, as increased attention was paid to, at that point, cocaine and child welfare issues, 
that there was a lot of talk about collaboration, but there wasn't a lot of method in and how to actually work on collaborative practice and what needed to happen when you invited partners to the table to work on these issues together. And in fact, in the late 1990s, uh, there were actually five national reports that were issued between 1998 and 1999. And you see on the PowerPoint slide the names of those, and also on the next slide there's a reference of where you can find those reports and a summary of those reports. If you're interested in looking at what these national reports identified as common barriers uh, between the systems and how service systems and the court needed to work together to address these barriers. And in fact, in our consulting work, we found that many jurisdictions that we were invited to go and work with uh, named these same kinds of barriers. And when they brainstormed and problem solved what should they do about it, they named these similar kinds of strategies. And so we felt that there was a need to organize that in some way so that we could help states and communities and tribes address these barriers and move more quickly through those processes. One of the reports that was issued was the uh, national report. I think someone else is controlling the slide, so let me see if we can go back to uh, the slide that List the blending perspectives and building common ground. Oh, there we go. And that was the report that was required as the Adoption and Safe Families Act was passed, asking the Department of Health and Human Services to issue a report to Congress on substance abuse and child welfare. And in that report, there were five national goals that were established. And you see building collaborative relationships assuring timely access to comprehensive substance abuse treatment, improving our ability to engage and retain clients in care and to support ongoing recovery, enhancing the services to children, and filling information gaps. Those national goals were then taken in much of the work of the federal government between the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration and the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families and Children's Bureau, which is the federal agency that oversees child welfare practice in the country. And in the aftermath of that establishment of these five national goals, they called together stakeholders and said, how should we implement uh, these goals? And what, what, does the, what do states and communities need to do in order to uh, implement the goals that have been set by the Department of Health and Human Services. And part of the work of SAMHSA and Children's Bureau was to create and to hold regional forums of state teams. And they asked Children and Family Futures to document models in several sites that had begun work to really delve into the details of how to uh, work on these issues. Uh, again, I'm not sure how those are sliding forward, but um, we'll, we'll try and make sure that we can stay up with that. Um, so in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2002, the Technical Assistance Publication, which is still available uh, from SAMHSA's Clearinghouse and from the Information Gateway from Children's Bureau, is a Technical Assistance Publication that describes what these seven sites around the country were doing. And, um, and in 2002, SAMHSA and Children's Bureau co-funded the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. Okay, now I'm going to press the mm -hmm. Yes, Nancy. There we go. Nancy, this is Seth. I'd like to interrupt for a second. Um, we're, we are experiencing a little bit of a technical problem, and so we'll advance your slides for you. If you could just let us know when you'd like us to move forward, just please uh, just say next slide, slide, please. All right. Thank you. So in that technical assistance publication, we tried to define what are the linkage points across systems. As I mentioned, there was a lot of discussion about go work together, go collaborate with your partners between treatment agencies and child welfare and courts. So 
there wasn't a lot of clarity about how to do that and what the work of collaborative practice was. So as we embarked in this effort to, to document these seven sites around the country, uh, we developed a framework that we could use to ask common questions to describe the components of the initiatives that have been put in place. And over the subsequent 10 years, we've made some refinements to the way that that framework uh, addresses these issues. And in fact, as we implemented with our project officers from the federal government, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, tried to address each of those system elements uh, to provide technical assistance resources in each of those areas. And I'll speak in a moment about some of those policy tools. So on the next slide, you see that as it, uh, there are four primary areas in which we, we have categorized these, the work of collaboration, what we refer to as the elements of system linkages. So the mission, the actual services that are provided to children, family, tribes, and communities coming together, the system elements are what we often refer to as sort of the structural supports that have to be put in place. And then the glue that, that pulls that together in establishing a way in which shared outcomes can be uh, developed, uh, guide the practice, and measured to show their effect. So on the next slide, you see that in each of those 10 areas, as we began this effort to provide technical assistance resources in those 10 system linkages, one of the tools that is available to communities is to really try and understand the different perspectives that come from child welfare services, substance abuse treatment agencies, and courts. The collaborative values inventory is a way to anonymously uh, answer some questions about what do you believe, what do you think about practice with this set of families. Um, and then the collaborative capacity instrument, again, is an anonymous way to, to give leadership or stakeholders in the community, collaborative partners, information about what workers and what others in the jurisdiction think is going well in terms of each of these elements of system linkages. And what are their areas of need? What are the areas in which practice and policy changes need to be developed? And then finally, what we refer to as the matrix of progress and system linkages is a practice-based, meaning that we have asked many practitioners, uh, well over 100 folks have had input into clarifying the characteristics in a community that has advanced its collaborative practice in each of those elements of system linkages. You'll see on the handouts that are available through the webinar today on that, uh, uh, the, the button that has the multiple pages up on the right-hand side, that there are several tools and handouts that relate to these, uh, the dimensions that I'm making in these policy tools. In addition, on the National Center's website, which on the front page of this PowerPoint, the website for the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare is listed. And if you go to that website under resources, there's a uh, resource page or a resource list on methamphetamine in children. And much of what I'm going to talk about next on the slide that the highlights again that elements of system linkages, that one of those areas uh, are those services that are tailored specifically for children. And the methamphetamine resource list that I spoke about on the, on the National Center website, I have some of these resources listed that are available to you. So on the next slide, we, we found as we were asked to talk specifically about methamphetamine and child welfare that we often saw practice in the child welfare community, uh, perhaps we could advance two slides, uh, that practice in the child welfare community often looked at parental substance use and particularly substance use related to methamphetamine as a unidimensional kind of phenomenon, that if they found that there was use, there was the standard response 
from child welfare without really differentiating the kind of situation that the child might be living in. And we want to look at each of these independently and to mention the ways in which uh, children may be placed at risk and what child welfare is looking for uh, often when they look at and identify parents in these different kinds of categories, using or abusing, a parent who is dependent, a parent who is making methamphetamine in small quantities in their home, a parent who's involved in trafficking, uh, one who might be involved in large quantities and super labs, uh, and then when mothers use methamphetamine when they're pregnant. So let's turn to the next slide. It's important to recognize that each of those different situations of the kinds of children and parents that we're dealing with in both treatment and in child welfare settings and in the dependency or juvenile court, that knowing what kind of situation the child is living in poses very different kinds of risks and should require a different kind of response. And that helping our partners in child welfare understand the differences in what kind of risk means that we can help them also differentiate the kind of response. And while there's not as much attention in the last few years to the number of children who are in situations in which parents are manufacturing uh, substances or methamphetamine in particular in their home and putting their children at risk, we know that from the sheer numbers of children who are living in families affected by substance use disorder that the greatest number of kids are those whose parent is a substance user or is dependent on the substance. For example, on the next slide, this is a graph that comes from the report to Congress and has been updated a couple times by the Office of Applied Studies, but very similar kinds of numbers. And if you hit the response one more time, um, you see that the number that I think is important and I often try and focus on is this 8.3 million children. So on the left you see the different ways in which from the survey on drug use and health we can count how many children are affected. Their parent used an illicit drug in the past year or in the past month. The parent's dependent on alcohol or drugs. The highlighted box there that the parent is dependent on alcohol or needs treatment for illicit drugs, that means 8.3 million children. It translates to about 11% of the children in our country. And to get some perspective on that, I often use the, the example that in an elementary school classroom of perhaps 30 children, there are three children who are going home to a situation in which a parent is dependent on alcohol or needs treatment for illicit drugs. When we think about the size of that population, it becomes much more challenging for child welfare to understand the risk to the children in these different situations and when substance use has created a risk of abuse or neglect that necessitates intervention either with the child remaining in the home or the child being removed from their home. Another piece of data that I think is important for us to look at on the next slide comes from Lynn Breck's work. And if you continue to slide those, those numbers in, what this means in the color coding of that light uh, tan color that although there may be a focus in methamphetamine treatment, on women that are using methamphetamine, very rarely is that woman using only methamphetamine. And if you look at their adolescent history, that nearly 100% in that tan color started out using alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana at 13 and 14 years old. About half of them use an uh, inhalant by the time they're about 15 and a half. And then you can see the progression of the multiple substances that are used by women uh, in the study that Lynn conducted in which she did qualitative interviews and histories of women uh, and, and highlighted this issue of the multi-substance use. And I see many of the other uh, participants that have been involved with the work of UCLA as participants on this webinar, so I appreciate the work that they have 
put forward to help us better understand the, the challenges for women and for their children. But if we think back to the number of children on that previous slide and think about the risks that they encounter and understand that the mothers often and the fathers who they are growing up with have perhaps had a long history of substance use often associated with other trauma that they've experienced as Virginia has talked about uh, and that often this has happened very early in their life and the adolescent youth uh, we really need to make sure that we're focused on when we think about how children are affected and when this child goes from uh, the child who then has children in her early 20s and becomes involved in the child welfare system and what that history has looked like for her. If we can look at the next slide and the, the issues and the challenges for children and families and the kinds of risk factors that child welfare workers are looking for uh, when a parent is identified as a methamphetamine user or someone who is in the abuse category. Um, certainly we hear about behaviors of parents, uh, the irritability, uh, confusion, poor judgment, the kinds of risks that would place a child to in uh, the inadequate supervision, uh, just the inconsistency in parenting and the chaos that sometimes is involved with the drug-seeking behavior. And again, this may not be someone who meets criteria for dependence, but we have to recognize that perhaps those children are also at uh, risk periodically, although it may not reach the level of chronic neglect. But there, there can be exposure to secondhand smoke. There can be accidental ingestion of, abuse, of that particular drug, or certainly uh, risk if the, if the parent is ingesting. So the reason to kind of lay out these different kinds of risk is to understand that the interventions need to also pay attention to those kinds of risks for children, uh, as we spoke about previously. When we look then at the next slide on parents who may be dependent on meth, we certainly have all of the same kinds of risks evident for children, um, but that the, the chronic neglect, and this is what we hear from child welfare practitioners, that they often see the allegations come into their system as chronic neglect and that some of the things related to medical care and uh, attending school, those are the kinds of indicators that child welfare may be looking at uh, when a parent is dependent. And then on the next slide, we, we talk about the increased risk when a parent may be cooking meth or, or manufacturing. All of those same kinds of risks, but we certainly recognize that there's additional risk of the fires and explosion and the chemical exposure, uh, and that children, we've come to realize through many of the, much of the work of the Drug Endangered Children Initiatives across the century, that children's higher metabolic rates, uh, that their own child development, that even uh, their skin differences between a child, an adolescent, and an adult places them at different kinds of risk. Uh, and just a normal development of children, that they put things in their mouth. So that when this is going on in their home, that there is a, a, an increased level of risk that has to be tended to. And then on the next slide, as we think about parents who may be involved in sales and trafficking, uh, the higher potential of violence, the presence of weapons, uh, the, the possibility of incarceration, and our population of children of incarcerated parents and what that means when uh, a parent is involved in trafficking and the situation for the children is also very critical for us to be aware of and to be addressing that ch those children's issues uh, in very specific ways. And then finally, if a parent is involved in the super lab type of approach that uh, those children may be less likely to be on site uh, but face additional and perhaps longer term kinds of risks if the parent is actually incarcerated. On the next slide, you see some data that were collected uh, several years ago, and 
Um, we recognize that these data are very incomplete, but we think it's important to look at the numbers of incidents of methamphetamine lab. Um, this data came from the Department of Justice. Uh, it's not data that they've continued to collect, in part because of difficulty in, in getting the information about the children. So we certainly expect that these, that these are counts that are under-reported. If you would uh, click one more time, the number of children taken into protective custody from these methamphetamine kinds of situations, methamphetamine lab situations, over those four years, uh, you see sort of dwarfs, um, about 3,000 children that were documented. And in that same time period, about 1 million children entered the child welfare system. And so in part, when I spoke earlier about the vast majority of children would be identified as, as children of a person who uses or is dependent on methamphetamine would be much more likely to be the case about what both treatment agencies and child welfare would be, uh, be handling on a regular basis, I would say, rather than, than those that are identified in the labs. And certainly as the, the country's efforts have moved forward in the production of methamphetamine, we see uh, less attention being paid to that particular issue. On the next slide, also from the work of the Drug Endangered Children collaboratives around the country, there is information that's been specified about what kinds of immediate interventions are needed for children. And again, you'll find this information in more detail on the National Center's website. But certainly understanding the initial medical assessment, if a child has been in an environment in which methamphetamine has been uh, used or there's been trafficking going on, um, and that there are immediate care protocol put in place uh, that addresses that exposure and the potential of chemical exposure for children. Um, on the next slide, then, uh, those medical interventions, again, are more fully described on our website and information from the Colorado Drug and Danger Children Collaborative in particular. When we turn our attention on the next slide to uh, the issues of moms who might use when they're pregnant. Uh, there's a resource, again, on the National Center's website on substance-exposed infants. And we looked at the, the issues at the state level and in communities around practice and policy of, of targeting prenatally exposed children. We know from estimates from the Office of Applied Studies and other work that has been done that about 10 to 11 percent of newborns have been prenatally exposed to drugs or alcohol during the prenatal period. That's about 400,000 infants per year. Uh, and we know from the number of children, zero to one, who are placed in out-of-home care, that even if we took all of those children as having been prenatally exposed, it only, only reaches about 5 percent of those 400,000 that are prenatally exposed. So when we look at the, the scope and then the interventions that are being put in place for mothers and their infants, if we can move to the next slide, that we recognize from the work of the several researchers in this uh, area, particularly Dr. Rizwan Shah, Dr. Barry Lester, uh, and the data that are available from the Office of Applied Studies that women who use meth or cocaine in the first trimester are more likely to use in the third trimester, that nicotine is universal at, among this population or, or nearly universal, and that marijuana and alcohol are secondary drugs. If we can turn to the next slide. So when we think about these numbers of children, again, that are prenatally exposed, we recognize also that the risk to that child varies a great deal. Those that are actually identified at birth are very small compared to the number of children who may have been exposed over the length of the pregnancy, but that many of those um, developmental disorders that are sometimes seen with this population, learning disabilities, social adjustments, language deficits, um, are really mediated by many different things that, if we can turn to the next slide, 
that the risks include risks that may not be just methamphetamine alone. So we looked at that slide that looked at the, the poly use factor for women in particular. Uh, so if, if, the, if the mother is also smoking or using other substances or other kinds of things that may be uh, compromising the health of the child. Uh, but that there are also conditions in the environment that affect this population, particularly the health and nutrition status of the mother, uh, and in a, many of the longer-term research studies on cocaine exposure, we know that these play significant factors in the outcome for the child and the mom. Uh, in particular, if we look at the next slide and the issues related to uh, fetal alcohol issues for those children exposed to alcohol, and particularly alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, you see many of the same kinds of descriptions of children that you see across the spectrum of a type of substance, uh, and that we really know most about alcohol-related uh, neurodevelopmental issues for children. And what that looks like in terms of this polydrug use, uh, we think we always have to be paying particular attention to. Uh, particularly as we look at the efforts underway to address school readiness and early childhood. Uh, many times in communities in which we're talking about early childhood uh, uh, services for families, these are the kinds of indicators that uh, school readiness and preschools are looking for in terms of trying to intervene with children to make sure that they're ready for school. Finally, when we look at what we know from the research, as I mentioned, over all of these years from looking at substance exposure for different substances, that the home environment is critical uh, and that the consequences that may be evident for children in the prenatal and post-birth uh, uh, time period can be mediated with early intervention. To, to reinforce, however, one more time, um, when we look at the next slide and the numbers, that most of the children who are prenatally exposed um, actually go home. They're not the children that end up being placed in out-of-home care. Um, most are not identified um, just based on the numbers of children with prenatal exposure and the numbers of children that are actually reported to child welfare agencies. And there are a variety of reasons why that is, that the, the testing is not uh, consistent across hospitals, across communities, that there may be inconsistent follow-up uh, for women who may have been identified at risk during the prenatal period, uh, but they did not test positive at birth. And a reminder that the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act uh, raised some issues when some amendments were placed a couple years ago um, requiring the child welfare agency to make sure that there is a, a plan of safe care when children have been identified at birth. If we look then at the next slide and how we try to then organize what do we mean by identification and the opportunities to intervene for children, the recognition that we typically identify kids at birth and that that is the, the trigger often for intervention. But if we back up into prenatal screening and even the awareness in our communities about uh, pregnancy awareness of substance use and its effects uh, during the pre-pregnancy phase, that those are opportunities for communities to intervene prior to getting uh, to having a child who's identified at birth uh, that may or may not have some of those neurodevelopmental effects, uh, but backing up into pre-pregnancy and prenatal screening is critical to prevention of, of uh, prenatally exposed identified at birth. And then if we look over the uh, requirement for, in the box that's identified as number four, in the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act that requires child welfare agencies to ensure if a child has been identified uh, as prenatally exposed at birth, that there is a plan for the infant's safety and responding to that infant's needs. And we certainly think that that connection then with the arrow of responding to the parent's needs 
becomes critical as we intervene on behalf of that child with a family-centered approach that addresses the needs of the moms and the dads also. And if we can click further in it and look at that uh, intervention as the child develops, uh, we may have not identified that child at first, but um, often if the child comes into the child welfare system uh, in early childhood and preschool years, that some of these uh, developmental issues still need to be addressed even through childhood and adolescence as we look at the response to uh, prenatal exposure and environmental exposure for children over time. If we can click then twice and wanted to just highlight some of those tools that are available to you. I mentioned the Substance Exposed Infants paper looking at state responses and the models that have been developed and some of those that are highlighted in that paper that's available to you again on the National Center's website. And then if we can click two times, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what do we know about how big is the problem of methamphetamine in child welfare caseloads. And unfortunately, my guess part of my message is we don't have really good numbers on that. Um, if you look at this chart, a very busy one, but the, the blue line is the number of children in foster care. At one point in time during those years, how many kids were in foster care? And you see after the Adoption of Safe Families Act, we began to see a decline in the number of children in care. But if you look at that in the context of the number of new users of various substances, it's very difficult to see a pattern. And although there is a lot of information about the association of parental substance use and child abuse and neglect, we don't have real good data about that association and substance use patterns. You see that the purple bar are those new methamphetamine users uh, over that time period. And while the increase in number of kids in out-of-home care sort of mirrors that, as, as methamphetamine new users began to decrease, we also saw a decrease in child welfare numbers. But we know that there were many other initiatives going on in child welfare, making an effort to keep kids from being able, from coming into care. So the message to this slide on the next slide is, is that there's really not a, a specific substance, we don't think, that's saying that this is what's driving child welfare practice caseloads, although we certainly recognize that the substance use pattern in a community, uh, the variation across the states and those jurisdictions in what their policies and their practices related to risk to children, how they identify those risks, what their state legislation calls for in terms of uh, substantiating abuse or neglect. The knowledge and the skills of workers are so critical for identification and for intervening with families, particularly looking at access to appropriate health and social supports as we're uh, intervening with families in a way that promotes their recovery. So while there's not a, a clear-cut uh, relationship, perhaps, we certainly know that there is an association. There are a couple slides that I want to pass to in the interest of time, and you'll have this detail in the handout if you download the PowerPoint. But if you would click through to the chart that says past year substance use by youth. I think this is one of those really critical uh, data elements that has come out of the Office of Applied Studies at SAMHSA. And it asked in the survey on drug use and health for adolescents, so children between the ages of 12 and 17, if they had ever been in foster care and what their substance use was in the past year. And you see in the blue bar that if the child reported that they had ever been in foster care, they were significantly more likely to have used alcohol and particularly illicit drugs in the prior year. And then on the next slide, they asked that same group, if you'd ever been in foster care, um, what was their need for alcohol treatment, for illicit drug treatment, or for alcohol or drug treatment? And you see, again, substantial differences among children who were in foster care and, the, and those children that were not about their need for treatment during adolescence. So often when we talk about the child welfare and substance abuse and court 
connection, we often focus on parental substance use, but we certainly know that there's a population of children who are at risk having been in the foster care system, therefore victims of child abuse or neglect that are at substantial risk of developing their own substance use disorder in adolescence. One more thing I want to highlight before we, we close. Uh, if you go forward, we're going to talk a little bit just about some training and tools that are available to you on the National Center's website uh, and click forward two slides. This is a screenshot from online training that is available uh, through the National Center. At no charge to the participant, we have three online uh, curricula that are available. The first is geared to substance abuse treatment professionals, and it explains child welfare, the dependency court, timelines, how to work with child welfare, what child welfare workers are looking for for information from treatment practitioners. The second online course is geared to child welfare workers, and it teaches them about addiction, treatment, and recovery, how to work with substance abuse treatment agencies, how to communicate, uh, and goes through some case study that is a parent who's involved with methamphetamine, as is her husband, uh, and presents that case study in a way that addresses the connections between treatment and child welfare. And then finally, the third online uh, course is geared to those that are practitioners in the court, so judges and attorneys that are working with families that are involved in uh, the court system and have substance use disorders and how practice and practitioners in the court uh, can better address those families' issues. And then on the next slide, as Virginia did, we wanted to make sure that you were aware of uh, information that is available to you through the evidence-based practice website. Uh, and let me just briefly say that this, uh, this chart, since that's not what's next on the slide that's coming up, although it's on my handout. So let me just briefly say that, that we're very excited by this map. This map shows uh, part of the uh, work that is going on across the country to address substance abuse and child welfare. The small dots are those grantees that are about just about two and a half years into implementing a grant program that came out from Children's Bureau targeting methamphetamine and child welfare. So if you are in one of these states, and you're not familiar with those dots that are in your state, we'd encourage you to get in touch with us to learn more about the grantee in your state and the work that is underway. The larger stars are those sites in which the National Center has worked uh, addressing practice and policy issues across these systems, and then more recently, family drug courts that were funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention the blue stars are those newer grantees that are developing or expanding family drug courts in those states. So again, if you're looking for additional information about what's going on in your state, please do get in touch with us. Um, I'm not sure why the next slide didn't come up with the evidence-based practice. If we could, could move through this one very quickly. And again, this is detail on how we're measuring outcomes across systems. Uh, so we'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, in the data collection and the logic model, to get in touch with us. And then finally, the website for the clearinghouse that's based in California, but very much national work on evidence-based practice in child welfare. And in particular, on the next slide, you see some of the programs that they have reviewed for substance abuse, uh, parent substance abuse in particular, with working with families in child welfare. Uh, so with that, I will turn things back over to Beth quickly and uh, appreciate very much your time and participation on the webinar today. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. That was great, and I appreciate you getting through your slides as quick as you could. Um, we would now like to take a few moments to open the um, floor for any additional questions. The webinar was actually scheduled until 3.30, but we will extend that a few more minutes if everyone um, has patience. Uh, Angela, if you'd like to explain what they need to do. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session.
If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Please record your first and last name. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Thank you. And while we're waiting for those calls or waiting to see if calls come in, I also would like to remind you that the uh, this webinar, the PowerPoint presentations, as well as the resource documents that we've been talking about will be available for the next 90 days at the same link that you are uh, using right now. For 90 days, you can go and download the PowerPoint presentations as well as the resource documents. Are there any questions, Angela? Yes, we do have one from Krista Rizzi. Your line is open. Hello. Go ahead, Krista. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. One of the things that I have found um, difficult in dealing with um, the welfare services is um, the denial that there's a need to intervene with parents that are using meth. And I, I, I found this to be the case in particular uh, in Arizona. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if this is common or what, if you have any um, possible suggestions on how to get them to take it more seriously. I guess what what I've heard is that there's such an issue with uh, methamphetamine use that if they were to go in and remove children from um, every situation from with, from parents that are using, that half the household <laughs> they'd be in every you know in half of the households and. To me, that's unacceptable, and, and pretty much their opinion is that um, it's lifestyle. And unless there's a severe case of neglect or abuse, they were not inclined to intervene. Well, Krista, this is Nancy, and I appreciate your, your question and comment. Um, you know, in fact, the, the state legislation that defines child abuse and neglect determines at what point child welfare would be intervening. And each state's practice is a little bit different in terms of how they view uh, substance use along that continuum of uh, risk to children that are either immediate safety concerns or longer term risk. Now, um, I wouldn't want to comment specifically on Arizona's policies, but there are folks at the state offices who uh, we have been in contact with over the years that are working on policies for child welfare and substance use treatment in the state. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd be happy to put you in touch with them and to more, try and more fully understand perhaps variation across states or the ways in which some workers are, are looking at this issue compared to others. Um, as a, another example, there are some states, uh, Maine and Washington in particular, that have implemented universal screening tools in their emergency, re not the emergency response uh, component of child welfare, but in the investigations unit, so that they're making a pretty immediate determination if substance use is a factor in the case and providing intervention pretty early in the case. So again, practice varies a great deal from state to state and often it's dependent on the state legislation. And sometimes it, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction within that state. So we'd ha be happy to talk with you further about it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions, Angela? There are no further questions at this time. Okay, wonderful. I'd like to again thank um, Dr. Young and Dr. Hernandez for participating today. We appreciate everything that you have uh, shared with the field and your excellent work. We'd also like to invite all of the participants to take part in the next webinar in the series entitled LGBT Populations in Meth, Updates for Addressing Challenges and Maximizing Opportunities. This webinar will take place on March 2nd at 2 o'clock p.m. and that is Eastern Time. Further information on this webinar and upcoming webinars in the series will be emailed out to all participants. If you would like to be included in those communications, please email your information to Sarah Mesa at S-M-E-S-A 
at sai-dc.com. In addition, more information regarding the series and upcoming events will be available at www.methpedia.org. And this full webinar and the resource documents will also be posted to that website within the next week. That concludes our webinar today. I appreciate your time and um, I look forward to uh, future webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. Please disconnect at this time.